Welcome back to the continuing repair of this PDP 1104. This is the third part and I hope it's the last part. At this point I don't know if I'm going to end up fixing it in this video but here's hoping. Just a quick recap. Because I have a PDP 1134 as well which uses the same console and console interface card oh, it was easy to determine that there was a problem with this this and in fact the Terminator card as well this one fix the problem there fix the problem here although another one developed that I don't think is related to my repair there was just a broken trace there a hairline crack and uh, then this chip blew up so I'm using the good one out of the PDP 1134 here so the problem is still on this board here this one from the 34 is okay from the 04 it's not and they both have a 8008 microprocessor and swapping that makes no difference so these are both good there's a problem on that board still I found one fault which I've fixed uh, I didn't think it would cause the symptoms I was getting on the console and fixing that didn't help I've been a bit slack lately I haven't done too much on this um, well, I've done a lot but I've also spent a lot of time not doing anything because frankly I'm getting a bit sick of it um, but what I have done is rebuilt this exerciser thing that I had in on a breadboard before I made a lot of proper circuit boards so it's a bit more stable and done a fair bit on the software that controls it I'll show you some of using that and then show you what I've discovered re faults I'll put the exerciser module on a sheet of wood there so that along with this block under there I can put some pressure on that board while probing without it flexing too much so this goes in where the microprocessor was and we've got to have a ground clip on negative of that capacitor over there. So here's my updated software. Uh, I've spent quite a bit of effort on it. Um, probably gone way overboard. In fact, I have. <laughs> uh, I'm, I guess I'm, I'm justifying that by thinking that some of the infrastructure developed in making this will be of use in similar testing functions elsewhere with this PDP stuff or, or, or elsewhere in general but <clears throat> we shall see I'll turn on the PDP <clears throat> and now I can connect can't do it when the PDP is not connected not sure why and there's a bit of colour coding here <clears throat> the yellow ones are all require probing, I didn't show that, did I? Yeah, there's a socket on the tester for a, a banana plug, just like a multimeter lead, and um, a probe here so I can test things, and there's a button, so when the software says stick this on such and such a pin, I put it there, press the button, and then it'll do the test, and when it's finished it'll beep. The A on A and tell me to move on to another pin. So back to the software. So, so those yellow ones require the use of the probe. The green ones are automatic so I guess you would um, run those and they, anything that they depend on that, that's been tested is tested before then. So if say the RAM test failed then you might go into these probe tests before that hopefully locate why the RAM's not working. I'll, just, I'll run through a few of them. I'll, I'll do the ones that don't need probing and then I'll show you a couple of the probe ones. Uh, I'll just run this first test which just checks that the uh, Arduino can drive the 8008 bus. If nothing on that bus is holding, it, holding the lines one way or the other. It just sets the pull-ups on the Arduino and that should be enough to pull the line one way or the other and it does so it's a pretty basic test passes uh, program ROM upload so this will read the contents of the two 
crumb chips. program that the 8008 executes and this, this has a reference copy that it can compare it to once it's uploaded and, and uh, there are two versions of this M7859 interface board they both have the same contents in their ROM so it should work for any version Just the reference copy, so that's all good. Another test I can do is the RAM, test the RAM. And, and it just repeats doing that. It's just completed one full set of work, so we'll, we'll call that done. Uh, indicator test, so we, this is at the console, so I'll move the camera. So hopefully that's good enough to see. Um, indicator test, just flashes these bottom three LEDs in a binary sequence, so run that. That's working. Numeric display test just runs these six digits, shows all eight possibilities on all six of them. That's all working. And just repeat, so we'll stop that. Keypad test and, that. and we press keys and it should light up on the screen. Gotta hold it for a second, the scanning rate's not too quick, but and it can handle multiple keys. And they all work. There's an example of one of the tests that uses the probe gizmo. Let's uh, check that the output so that can be turned on at the appropriate time. So let's see big 74154 chip there. I'll do this just so we can see one example and from then on I won't bother showing that or I won't bother showing that whichever one's least relevant. Uh, so turn it on and connect again and that one I was just talking about that 74154 is uh, the selection decoder so I'll go for that, run the test, and it says stick the probe on E48 pin 1, so that's E48, stick it there and press the button, and I don't know if you heard the beeps there, it's pretty soft on this PC, but it was saying yes that worked, move on to pin 2, so move to pin 2, press the button, you can also press this here, in E3 I'll just Press enter, same difference, pin 4, etc, pin 5, and like, even if I press it without this on there, I've got a bit of time to get around to it, pin 6, there we go, pin 7, again, and if I don't put it on in time, it'll time out. And I just press again. Uh, pin 8, I think it is. No, pin 7. Got pin 8. Pin 9. Pin 10. Pin 11. So you've got a bit of time to make sure that you've got good contact. Pin 13, etc. I won't bother all the rest. They all work. And there's another, a number of other probe tests checking that uh, the contents of these registers can be loaded. These three and, and there, and the outputs of those can be presented to the Unibus and read back in. So there's probe tests for there and there. And then I realised, well, what I can do is write things to write addresses to this register, enable it onto the Unibus, let it come back here, enable a uh, read via those buffers back in. So you can do a loop, a loop test all the way around, testing the three bytes that make up that register. 
putting stuff in each of the each of the bite in turn and enabling each of those bites onto the data bus. So there's 18 bits there and it comes down to only eight there. So we need three enable lines there and we need three enable load lines there for the three bytes, although one of them's only four bits. <coughs> Likewise for the switch register, we can load data into that, enable onto the Unibus data lines and read it back here. And this is where I found some curious stuff. I'll, I'll show you the address lines first. I'll just show it on my PC. We won't, need, we won't worry about looking at it on the probes. So, cancel that and go to Unibus address loopback. So, writing into the 18 bits of the bus address register, enabling them onto the Unibus which you have to do to read them back because you need the terminators. These are open collector outputs, so you need the Unibus terminators to get any data out of them. Then they're available on here, and by enabling different bytes out of that, we can read them back in. And so we can test quite a chunk of stuff that way. That's what I'll do now. Address loopback test, run test. And you'll see it's not working. Stop it. It writes data and if it comes back correct it says yes good and shows you the data that it wrote. If it doesn't it says this is what I wrote, this is what I read back and then there's these syndrome bits which are the difference between what it wrote and what, what came back. And you can see it's always one bit or another bit or both, usually both. And curiously, it's the same bit in the low byte as in the same bit in the middle byte. In the, in the high byte, there is no bit in that position. There's only two bits there, so 8, 8 and 2. In the low 8 bits and the middle 8 bits, it's the same faulty bit, which would indicate that... <coughs> The problem lies somewhere when it, I mean the chances of both of them being faulty are two bits in, the, in here, or two bits in there, or two bits in there being faulty, or maybe it's one of each, one there and one there, or maybe not. It, it makes you wonder if there's something wrong on the 8-bit side, or like that the 04 position in there, so that whichever, the low byte or the high byte, whichever one you're enabling, you get that faulty bit. But then the ROM and the RAM tests wouldn't work. So that doesn't really make sense. We can do a similar thing for the data lines using the switch address register and read that back. To do that though we have to put the address of the switch register in there so that and then enable the address lines so that the switch address decoder can see that we've got the address of the switch register loaded then it will enable the switch register data lines onto the Unibus data lines there so it's a bit more complex to test for this we just have to put the data in there and turn on the 19th bit which enables the 18 onto the data bus uh, address bus here we've got to set up the address as well so doing that this test here and run that and look at that we're getting substantially the same error two bad bits in the same positions which is which even more makes you think that it's somewhere in those eight on the eight bit side because the 18 or 16 bit halves are separate. So why should you get the same error? You'd think it, it, there's one bad bit on this side. Now, I don't know how I missed this when I was drawing out that block diagram, but because it's on the same page in the schematics, but this line here coming out of this is the switch register address decoder, so it looks for the uh, uh, 777 uh, 
507, I think it is, uh, address, or 3778 in hex. It looks for that address and then enables this line which puts the switch register onto the Unibus data lines. And I thought that's the only way to do that, to, to make those to make the switch register go to the Unibus address lines, I thought I have to get this going. But then I much later noticed it's also over there. It's one of the bits in this Unibus control register. In fact, that and that are wired all via this resistor. So uh, I've updated the uh, block diagram along with a few other things, but the Unibus control register here, one of the bits gets wired or with the output of the switch register address decoder to enable the switch register onto the Unibus data lines. So if I redo that loop test, which takes that data path, if I re redo that, but enable this switch register onto the Unibus, not by setting the switch register address in the bus address register and enabling the enabling it onto the address lines, all I have to do is just turn on this one bit in that register. And when I do that, well, I've had some problems with uh, wires coming out of the Arduino board. But then, I, as I mentioned, I've found another way of enabling the switch register onto the data bus that doesn't involve using the switch register address decoder. And I'll run that test now. No problems. No problems. The fact that we get the same bad bit in the low byte and the high byte, uh, low byte and the next byte, for both address and for data, points to something wrong along here, where it's eight bits. You know, one bad line there would explain all of that, except that the RAM test works and reading the ROM comes out correctly as well. So, being completely bamboozled, I thought, well, what I'll do, just for fun, I'll try and see what's, what can be affecting that. And one of the things is the console connector here. And if I just unplug that, and run these tests again, and the address register loop back, No problem. Do the data loop back using the switch register to enable the data lines. No problem. Use the Unibus control register bit to enable the switch register onto the data lines. No problem. So ain't that peculiar. Now again, that could just be a, a furphy that only appears on this board, just like the timing issue with the the state bits in the previous video and just as a sort of a sanity check I decided to try the good M7859 board one of those two chips there and see if I get similar results so running those same loopback tests just a sanity check we just run the RAM test see that the basics work it's running away and there's no errors coming out and ROM upload you see the beginning of that it is picking up data and that looks to be the right data ok, address loop back test and this is with the console plugged in and we're getting good loop backs unlike on the other board where we get that 04 syndrome business now with the data loop back test where the uh, switch register is enabled onto the data bus via the address bus decoder, the switch address decoder, or via the Unibus control registers, register bit. Uh, either way, we get this, and you can see the syndrome is always what we put in, except when it's zero, because it's always reading back to zero. And if I do it using the other way of enabling the data bus, 
same difference. I, I, I don't plan on trying to analyse why that happens because it's something to do with this extra business, this extra logic in the um, that's been added, those two extra chips, which is this business here. I'm not sure why it should affect it, but obviously it does. Uh, shit. This is part of a loop, so it's uh, much harder to analyse. Right, some of this output here comes back and forms part of the input, as I recall. Can't see it right now. I'll see if I can find something about that. But uh, yeah, I'm not going to worry about the fact that the data tests on this don't work. It's something to do with that, and the tests which were created for the other board don't need to take this into account and didn't, and it's not surprising we don't get exactly the right result. But the important thing is that on the address loopback, we don't get that error. And I'm now going to unplug the console, and no difference. That would have made it work on the other board. So now I'm going to go back to the other board and try and find out what's going on by connecting wires one at a time from there to there until that loopback problem returns because it, it's not there when this is disconnected. Initially I'll just do the uh, the power signals, just plus, plus 5 volts and ground, see if that brings it on, but I suspect it'll be when I get to the bit 4 uh, from the keypad that, that uh, the problem will appear. But, uh, let's see what happens. Right, back to the faulty board and just first off we'll do the plus 5 volts and ground. See, see that uh, we haven't got a short circuit, I haven't got them backwards and um, see if any problems happen. Okay, turning it on. Just loop back. Still good because we've connected only the ground and power. No signals yet. Stop that. Uh, can't get any sense out of anything else, so can we indicate there's nothing else will happen? So I can't do much without adding more wires. Okay, which ones am I going to add? So we've connected these two pins, 19 and 20, which give the this is the connector to the console, uh, plus 5 volts and ground, just as a sanity check and to make sure I've got the numbering right, I'm just going to connect those three there, 3, 4 and 5, which go to the three LEDs that the indicator test operates. So that's uh, these three wires over here, there's the other two. And let's run that test. Better turn the computer on first. Huh? And there they are blinking. So I've got the right three pins. OK, next I want to try, I suspect it's uh, these are the three that might be causing the problem because they end up going to that internal data bus input side. These come from a register on the output side. These are just these just go through a buffer and then they go onto that uh, the eight bit input bus where I suspect the problem is. So uh, I'm not sure which way it counts from, but the third bit, bit two or the O four position. It's either 8 if you count this way or 7 if you count this way. So uh, we'll do the outside two first. See that that doesn't cause a problem with the uh, loop back and then see that connecting either 7 or 8 does. Okay, two more wires, uh, 9 and 8, the two outside keypad signals, which I suspect are not the ones causing the problem. So. Going to the loop back test again, run test, and not getting an error. And the data loop back tests also, no error. Pin, so I'll connect uh, 7 and see what that does. Now pin 7 has been connected, second from the bottom, run test, not getting an error. And the address, and getting an error on the data. Okay, try pin 8. Okay, pin 8 is now connected. Let's run the 
just look back. No error. Mmm. Okay. So, so much for that theory. So, we've connected those two and those four and three of those there. I guess I'll just connect those three and see, see what happens and then try three of those and three of those and check it each time. I've actually also connected one and two and these guys. So now everything's connected except these six. I tried uh, 13, I've connected 13 and it works but now I'm running the address loop back and you can see it's working and if I join in pin 14 and run the test again we get the error the second of these scan bits why? hmm curious so when this one wire was connected we didn't get our syndrome bit problem but it appeared as soon as I connected the second one. Now, is that because there's something specific about that one, or is it simply that it doesn't like at least two of these connected, some loading issue? So the next thing I'll do is connect the remaining four and see if it still just works or doesn't work, depending on whether or not that second one is connected. Now, all these come from a couple of, from a set of, uh, 7417 buffers and they are from the low byte of the bus address register um, on the schematic that's pin H on the connector and if we look at the actual schematic pin H is E72 and it's driven by signal KY6 scan 5 which is there. Now this has got, it's uh, the fourth bit in that uh, register. It doesn't seem to bear any relation to where the syndrome bit is, but then the syndrome bit is appearing on this bus and we're talking about stuff over here. So it's really hard to see how what's going on there can affect what's happening here. It might just be a timing issue and have actually nothing to do with why this console board doesn't work. But it's the only anomaly I've got to work with, so I'm pursuing it for the moment. So the next thing to do is um, yeah, try connecting these last four and see what happens. Uh, and then based on that, try and work out how this could possibly be causing the problem. Replace this chip. Mm. All this stuff seems to work though for the keyboard scanning and the numeric display. So I really don't understand what's going on. Moving right along because this video is starting to get pretty long. Uh, I've reconnected all these pins via that menagerie there. And I've discovered that the address, the address loopback test fails when I have this pin here connected. Initially I had... With all of them disconnected, I could connect 13, didn't cause a problem. 14 caused a problem. And I've since discovered that connecting any of those five there will bring on an address loop test, a loopback test error. And it's curious that the one that doesn't is the one that doesn't form part of the multiplexing for the keypad matrix. Whether that's got anything to do with it, I'm not sure, but it might be significant. So. And the errors that each of these cores, when they're connected, is different. And I actually made up a, an error matrix showing which errors, which address values got an error versus which pins were connected. And there's a definite pattern there. And I looked at it for only a few seconds and my eyes glazed over and I just couldn't be bothered trying to see what the pattern was. So I just moved on to the data loopback test and doing a similar thing and I found that again 13 didn't matter if it was connected or not 14 caused the error 
or 15 being connected cause error, but 16, 17, 18 didn't cause the error. Again, don't know why I didn't look into it. So I return to my original suspicion of this pin here, number seven, which goes into here, and that, the, the bit that caused you know, the 04, the syndrome bit. Uh, so that was directly uh, relevant to the errors that I was seeing. So forgetting what's going on over there from this side of things, I decided that, to look at that. And so I disconnected just that wire there. With all of these connected, there was no, no more errors in the loopbacks, either data or address. If I disconnected that one or the other two, the error was still there. The only thing that got rid of the error was removing that number seven, which is which goes into here through these 74125 tri-state buffers into the 04 bit. So that's looking really suspicious. Those lines from the keypad, these four, are here. They go into the 74125 buffers at E74, which is here. And the one, yeah, so E74, they all go into that. So I'm suspecting that chip, because if pin R, that one there, is dodgy, we'll get an 04 that shouldn't be there. Or a not 04, sorry, a zero in there that shouldn't be there. So, so I'm suspecting this guy. Anyway, this E74 is, E74 is this chip here, right next to the other one that I repaired. So that's suspicious also. Uh, either whatever took this out also affected him, or my repair of this involves some collateral damage around this one. So uh, the next thing to do is pull this board out and have a real good look all around there, see if I can find anything dodgy, broken traces, short circuits, crud, whatever. If not, then I'll replace him. So we'll see how we go with that. So I've been putting it off for about a week because <laughs> I'm scared that if this doesn't fix it, I'm flat out of ideas. So the, the, the suspicion is this chip. I've got reason to believe it, something wrong with it, but I'm not 100% convinced because it does seem to work in other situations that I've tested. So, yeah, I'm, I'm not confident that, I'm, that replacing it will fix things. You know, I've looked at the board. I can't see anything, see anything particularly dodgy about the connections, at least no more so than other parts of the board. So the thing to do is I'll snip out the pins, snip chip out of the, there, leaving the pins rather than trying to remove the pins from the board like I did with this chip which caused traces to break and then solder the new chip onto the pins that are remaining from this one. So I'll snip it out and see how we go. It didn't come off as cleanly as this one when I took it off. It's uh, pretty rough and ready but I should be able to get some solder onto each of those by hook or by crook. So let's have a go at that now. So there it is. Not not very pretty, standing up a fair bit, but uh, at least not intrusive to the board. So uh, maybe one day when I get a decent desoldering system I'll, um, that, that doesn't damage tracks, I'll take that off, remove the pins and install it properly. But for now, it should at least uh, tell us if, if that was the problem. So I'll reinstall the microprocessor put it in the board, it won't bother with the exercise of test jig, I'll just put the processor in, plug it in and see if the console starts to behave. And if that doesn't work, then uh, bugger if I know. The moment of truth. Board's back in place with the processor, front cable connected, so let's see what happens when we turn the bugger on. Mains power, here it goes. Oh, 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 I'm excited. Yeah, how's that test go? Uh, clear. 
One, two, three, four, five, six. Load switch register. Seven, 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 five, seven, zero. Load address. Examine. You little beauty. Fucking brilliant. Ain't that great? After all this time, I've put a lot of effort into this. I've probably done it in a very long-winded way, but it, I can at least say that it was a systematic way that uh, was bound to produce uncover faults because it logically and systematically went through every part of the board, even though the part I ended up replacing it didn't um, seem a bit ambiguous, but at least the testing system pointed me at it. So I'm uh, very happy with this. Um, bloody hell, you have no idea how relieved I am. <laughs> so, I'm a bit sick of PDP-11s right now. There's some other things I want to do. But, uh, I, in the not too distant future, I'm going to plug the memory card in here and see if I can talk to it, and then, and then the CPU, and do that for the 1134 as well. And uh, at least get both machines so that they can be driven from the front console into a program and have it run. But um, yeah, for the moment, I'm just so relieved. <laughs> hope you enjoyed this. <laughs> hope you hope you persevered with it through, through all this, and. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, uh, give it a thumbs up, please. Um, and if you liked all this stuff, give it a subscribe. I might put an addendum after this because I didn't fully explain, or at least I don't think I explained clearly anywhere, uh, how this board operates. I, I could go through the uh, updated block diagram and, and try and describe a bit more clearly how it works. And I've actually recorded all that, but I didn't put it in, but I think I'll tack it on the end of this and uh, yeah thank you for putting up with it to this point uh, catch you later I've got a, a newer version of this block diagram it's a bit more busy but it's got a lot more information in it so starting from the top uh, of course the microprocessor is central to this and I should also mention that uh, I've been calling it an MCU, a microcontroller, which is not correct. The thing has no I.O. capability. It doesn't even have RAM or ROM. It is purely a central processor. I avoided that term because it could result in confusion with the CPU of the PDP-11 itself. So uh, I've decided that I'll try and use the term MPU for microprocessor unit from here on. So anyway, it's, it's the boss of the thing and it communicates to the rest of the board via an 8-bit bidirectional bus and some control signals to, to tell the system what's on that bus. That communicates via a transceiver which allows data onto the bus if it's enabled and of course the processor must be in a state so that it's reading rather than writing the bus when that's the case and it also, whatever gets on that bus, whether from the processor or from the receivers, is always enabled out here. And this, the, the data out comes, except for the input to the RAM, goes into this address register and then out to these other places around the show. And that may all result in data coming back via a number of possibilities onto this input bus. And when enabled, the processor will read it in. Now this address register is it's a bit of a misnomer it, because yes it does contain addresses but it also contains data and control information although that, that control information can be viewed as addresses it's uh, contained in the upper bits so it, the region of the address space that it's writing to is the control information so uh, the RAM, for instance, is a particular range of addresses. The ROMs another particular range, and all these other registers that can be input or output to the processor uh, have their own addresses, and that's all determined by this stuff here, all this control logic. The lower eight bits of the 16-bit address register are data, and the upper bits are the address information that say where to put that data. Sometimes the data is irrelevant. The, the upper eight bits merely select, for instance, on inputs, select, for instance, that to put its output onto the bus. And in that case, the data bits are irrelevant. But when it's, say, loading the switch register, 
then the data bits are relevant. And these signals, these here, these sort of things, indicate that indicate signals that load data into these registers or enable them to pass it through. And they come from this selection decoder. There's only eight bits of data, but some of these registers are, are wider than eight bits. This one's 20 bits, and this one's 16, this one's eight, this one's only four. When this is to be loaded, it, it takes three operations. First to present the eight bits for the lower eight bits of the register, and then the upper part of the address will go through the decoding process and enable this top signal to load those eight bits into here. Then it will present the eight bits to appear on the high, uh, on the middle byte of that 20 bits, and this signal will be, will be enabled by the high part of the address when that eight bits is presented. And finally, the top four bits, only the lowest, the low half of that eight bits is relevant, and it's a, it provides the four bits into there, and the address turns on this line. Likewise for the switch register, it's got two halves of eight bits and two lines to enable it. This is eight bits, so it only needs one line. This is only four, so it only needs one line. In a similar way, this 18-bit register, consisting of two lots of eight and two bits, enables each of those three parts onto this 8-bit bus. So again, the processor has to say, present an address, which will, through the logic, enable one of these three lines, and the appropriate part of this register will then be presented to this bus, and at the same time, the, the logic will also activate this signal, which enables the receivers. And of course, that only becomes activated when the processor state signals indicate that it's about to receive. So the processor automatically is not driving the bus at that time. And similarly for here, there's, there's only 16 bits, so two, two parts to drive it. Uh, only four bits there, so one signal. Although, you know, one signal there enables four bits and two bits. Four, four from the keypad and two from somewhere else. Again, 12 bits there coming in, so one line activates the lower eight and the other line activates the upper four. So that's briefly how it works. Um, when it's writing to the RAM, uh, the data comes from here and the address to write it to is presented on the lower four bits of this, which go there, and the upper parts of the address go through the decoding logic and enable the RAM write signal. When we want to read from the RAM, Again, those lower four bits indicate the address, but this time the write signal isn't enabled. This signal here is, so the ROM enabled onto this output bus, uh, RAM, sorry. And when we want to read from the ROM, uh, nine bits go into here and, and into here, because that ninth bit is used to select which of the two ROM chips are active. And so we get these two signals, and again, they enable the ROM output onto the internal input bus. So I hope that clears it up a little bit. These numbers in curly brackets and italics indicate the high order address bits. So for instance, 5, 6 loads the lower half of this register and 5, 8 loads the upper half and the XX is the data that gets loaded into it. For instance here, 5, 0, 5, 2 and 5, 4, with XX being the data that gets loaded in each of these cases. So uh, just putting out to the address bus, to the address register, 5, 0 and 8 bits of data loads the low half, the low byte of this register. Then 5, 4, sorry, 5, 2 and 8 bits goes into the middle half and 5, 4 and 4 bits goes into here. So hopefully that rather rough explanation makes it a bit more clear what's going on and uh, it'll be a bit easier to understand what I'm trying to describe.